you have your Bibles, you can be turning over to Exodus chapter 3 as we'll look at some passages from chapter 3 and 4. Uh, we'll start in chapter 3 this, this morning. Uh, we're going to kind of take a, a few weeks, just maybe three or four weeks, and talk about leadership in the church. We're going to do a little sermon series entitled Answering the Call. Uh, as you are well aware of, in, in late September, we will be selecting uh, and, and re- confirming maybe some of the leaders that are within our congregation and, and I mentioned I touched on it briefly uh, in, in my offertory uh, meditation but you know how the church needs to be in good hands it takes biblical leadership uh, as and as we look at the church to be able to be governed properly maybe I could entitle this message today for biblical truths uh, about leadership not simply for truths but it applies in all aspects of life. Uh, God will use us if we allow him to do so. And so to, over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at God's call for leaders in the church. We're, in particular, we're talking about elders and deacons and the role they'll play in the local body here of New Testament Christian Church. That portion, as Brother Al likes to call, he says he always mentions the you know, New Testament portion of, of God's church because we realize we're not the only people that are a member of God's church. But we want to understand how uh, God wants to use us. We don't want to simply limit ourselves. That's the reason I'm going to use some, uh, maybe some, just some ideas that will apply to all aspects of life, not simply just in church leadership. I think the one ingredient that's necessary uh, for any organization is good leadership. I've always been passionate about leadership. I've always had a struggle with uh, being involved, whether it be a work uh, situation or even in volunteer organizations, or even in the local church, where they just seem to really struggle for vision and direction. Because if you don't know where you're going as a leader, I've often learned that the people don't know where to go. And so the Bible uses this shepherd mentality, this metaphor that would be used throughout Scripture uh, in leading people. Uh, Here's what Charles Swindoll defines leadership as, and he does use two words, inspiring influence. You have to be inspired, don't you? I mean, you have to be able to inspire people. You have to have influence in their lives, but but it has to be some a positive. Inspiring influence is a positive thing. And so effective leaders are people who inspire other people to follow. Now, you don't have to hold a title to be an inspiring leader. You don't have to be a, a person who holds a title to have inspiring leadership abilities and influence in their lives. I, I've known some wonderful people throughout my life uh, do, who just people I gravitated toward. Will it be somebody I look to as an advisor or a mentor or someone who I would go to just simply because I felt like they had wisdom on a subject and they inspired me to kind of excel in that area. And so, again, the purpose of this sermon series over the next three or four weeks will simply be to kind of motivate us to expand our influence for Jesus. That's what it's all about. It's not about who's got the highest title or the lowest title. It's not about whoever can seem to be, uh, uh, you know, maybe seem to have it more together than the next individual. We find out throughout Scripture that God has used some very flawed individuals, as we'll look at Moses today, uh, to lead his people and to accomplish his will. Fred Smith, in his book, Ready to Lead, says this. He says, when God wants something done, he turns to an individual such as a Moses, David, P- Peter, or and Paul. People like Martin Luther, Dwight Moody, Mother Teresa, and Billy Graham. Rarely do things get done by consent. Huh? Rarely do we all just consent that things are going to get done. It needs to be somebody leading. And, and so we recruit uh, leaders in the church to, to lead in all aspects. We have youth leaders. We have Sunday school leaders. We've got deacons and elders. And, 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 and we've got all kinds of people that should be mature enough to lead in, in every area of our church. But we also need uh, to stir up the gift of leadership in people. If you were here with us on Wednesday night as we studied Ephesians chapter 4, we begin to read that passage of Scripture uh, in verses 11 through how it says he gave some what to be apostles some to be prophets some to be pastors and teachers now he's not limiting the scope of leadership and ability what he's really saying is he if we go back and read the beginning of that passage it says that it was by God's grace that we were given these gifts now guess what he calls them gifts 
You know, here's the thing about grace, as I mentioned Wednesday night. Does anybody understand what grace is? It is something, it is Bible, biblical definition is unmerited favor. It's something you don't deserve. It's maybe something you shouldn't have, but God gives it to you anyway. Just as God grants us salvation by his grace, he also, through that same grace, grants, grants us these leadership abilities, these different gifts amongst the church to help build up, as we would read in that Ephesians 4 passage, so that we can all be brought to what? More knowledge of Christ and maturity in our faith. That's what these are all about. And so as we look at these full truths today, I want you to understand that's what God's trying to convey. So we want to look at maybe Moses' life. I think he's probably one of the best leaders in all of history when we consider the type of man he was. I mean, he was called to lead the Israelites out of Egypt to the land of Canaan. He, 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 he led them from slavery to freedom. Now, that was a huge job, don't you think? And, you know, it, it, was, it was so great, in fact, that he almost buckled under the pressure and stress himself of, of leading that task. And, and so we're going to look a little bit about his life and how effective he was uh, today. Here, let's read with me in verses 1 through 4 of Exodus chapter 3. Here's what he says. Now, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he, he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire with, and from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over to see this strange sight. Why this bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. I want us to understand maybe the first truth we need to understand about leadership is that leaders are prepared in advance by God. I, I, I've always been a behind-the-scenes type person. If you classify me and you do personality and analysis on me, I'm more the type of person who loves to get behind the scenes and do things. I am a doer, if we could put it that way. I'm the type of person you want a chair moved. I'm your guy. It, it bothers me to no end when I'm seeing people do these tasks and sweeping the floor in the fellowship hall and, and cleaning up and taking the trash and, and not because they're not doing it right because I think I need to be the one doing it. And I have a difficult time surrendering those responsibilities to other people because I'm the type of person who wants to pitch in and do. But as I got more involved in my relationship with Christ, I found out that he had gifted me in other areas instead of simply being a doer, as I would put myself. But he has given me a gift of leadership and a capacity. And as I've done my study and as I begin to think back about my, my life and the way that God had begun to order my steps way before I'd even accepted Jesus as, as my Lord and Savior, how he's used all the experiences of my life to prepare me in advance for what he has called me to do today. And so, as I think about that, I always know that God is trying to accomplish his will. You know, he's not a knee-jerk reaction type God. He doesn't see a crisis happening and says, oh, I need to do something. We're never going to take him off guard. You know what happened here in this passage in Ephesians chapter 3? I mean, excuse me, Exodus chapter 3. Is, is, is he said, he sets this bush on fire that's not going to burn up. There's a flame there. It's just burning. And it gets Moses' attention. But now he has to wait to see if Moses is going to come and respond to it. He could have walked right on by, couldn't he? And what did he say? He says, I need to go over there and see why this bush is not burning up. Why it's on fire and it won't, catch, and it won't burn. And, and, and so then it says, when God saw that he was coming. Hmm? You see, he'd already prepared, prepared in advance for him to be there. And he says, when he saw that he was coming, then he called him. And God's already prepared some steps for you in your life. He's looking to call you. You may not realize what God is trying to accomplish in your life right at this moment, but God is trying to prepare you in advance to do something great for him as you lead. Now, you think about Moses and type of man he was. I mean, he's 80 years old. He's just a sheep herder at this point, and, and, and God's called him to be this great leader. And you just consider his life. You remember maybe Moses, he's this guy, uh, he was obviously good looking because the Bible says his mother said he was such a beautiful child. And he was known throughout history, antiquity history, that said, said, said he was just a very handsome man. 
And, and so his mother, when Pharaoh realizes that, that the, the, the Israelite people are getting so large, he says, we got to kill all these male children. And we're going to put them all to death. Mom couldn't put, kill them. She didn't want anybody else to do it. So what does she do? She makes this little basket and, and covers it in pitch. She puts the baby in it. And then she, she puts them adrift over there by where Pharaoh's daughter would be. And then sends her own daughter to follow along, make sure he's okay. You see how God's always got things prepared in advance? He sends his own daughter along to, to make sure that, that, that she's okay. And then when Pharaoh's daughter sees, sees the baby, guess what happened? His sister goes over and says, I know a woman who can take care of this baby. And it's his own mother. She can nurse him until he gets old enough to live in Pharaoh's house. As a result of that, uh, he's growing up. Moses is growing up as Pharaoh's child, basically. And, and so he's being schooled by the most intellectual people of his time. He knows how to speak not only the Hebrew language, but also the Egyptian language. And so as a result of that, God knows that he's a man that can get the job done. You see how he prepared him way ahead of time for this, this, this experience that he was going to be going through? You see, he understood power, but he also had empathy for the slaves because he loved the Hebrew people. Gene Getz wrote, God gifted Moses with three-dimensional uh, uh, with a three-dimensional a three-dimensional advantage. First, he had great physical assets. We talked about that. He was a beautiful child. And secondly, Moses was also a smart man. In Acts chapter 7, verse 22, it says he was educated in all the learning uh, of, of the Egyptians. He became a scholar. And, 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 and so Moses became very educated in one of the most advanced civilizations. He also had exceptional leadership abilities. That's what the Bible would say in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. was a man of power in word and deed. Not simply, I say something, you do it. But he could get things done. Leadership is a gift that needs to be developed. Not everyone is gifted to lead. Some people want to, but that's maybe not your gift. In Romans it says everyone has different gifts. And, and if your gift is leadership, then you govern diligently. Henry Ford once, once said, uh, he said, said, to ask who should be the leader is like asking who should be tenor in the quartet. The tenor should be the tenor, and the leader should be the leader. I've been in church situations where we've had bass trying to sing tenor when it comes to leadership. Then you've got people like me who can't sing a lick. My wife was just singing in the choir. She enjoys singing. She's like me. She loves singing. She's a lot better singer than I am. She's, she's a bit more gifted in that area. Just Wednesday night in, 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 uh, in this, the rehearsal they were doing for choir practice after church services, uh, Jennifer said, what part do you sing? She said, whatever comes out. <laughs> That's me. <coughs> Secondly, leaders have a God-given purpose. I mean, what a contrast between Moses' first 40 years of life and his last 40 years. You've got to remember, he's, he's 80 years old when God's going to tell him he wants to take this major undertaking on. Hmm? Now, how many of you are pushing 80 and, and, and you're thinking about starting a new career? Hmm? I mean, who of you among you would say, you know what, I think I'd just really, really just be the leader of a new nation. I think I want to take that on right now. Most of the time, by that stage of life, you've gotten pretty comfortable with where you are, aren't you? You realize, I just need to slow down and relax a little bit. But see, God had a purpose in all that had taken place in his life. The first 40 years, he's leading an army. He, he, he's a big leader in a, in, a, in a big civilized civilization. The last 40 years, he's been just herding sheep and, uh, throughout the desert. But God even used that time so that he understood, look, I know where I'm going. I've had sheep all over this wilderness, this desert area. I know where I can find them water. I know where God's going to lead them to get food. I know. You, you see what I'm saying? God's using all those experiences out throughout his entire life to get him to where he wants them to be. He had a purpose for everything that he went through in his life. I can look back in my own life and see how God prepared me for ministry. I had a mom and dad who I love, and, but they didn't take us to church every Sunday like many of you do your children. Maybe you were brought to church. You remember we talked about Dr. Tony Evans, how he said when he was young he had a drug problem. He was drugged to church on Sunday morning. He was drugged to church on Sunday night. He was drugged to church on Wednesday night. He was drugged to every meeting that the church had. I didn't have no drug problem when I was young. But I was blessed with a grandmother who loved the Lord, and she talked about him often. 
I mean, every time I got around her, I mean, I knew he was real because she knew he was real. You know people that way. He's just like somebody. You know, like you go by and visit somebody, and you say, you go to visit your relative, and you say, have you heard from your sister? Have you heard from your brother? Have you heard from your grandma? Have you? And they just start talking about them. And you know they're real people because of the way they always talk about them, though you may never get to see them that often. That's the way my grandmother was about Jesus. And so I knew he was real. You know, I had co-workers and friends who cared enough about me to invite me to church on a regular basis. Eventually, I accepted the invitation, and I continued to go. Who would have known? I could have went one day and said, well, I've, I've pacified them now. I don't have to go anymore. But it was something about that and that preparation that God was doing, the purpose he had behind, behind all of those interactions with my co-workers and that time I had with my grandmother as she talked about the Lord, how... how God was preparing me to be receptive to what I was going to hear that day when I came to the church. And he prepared my heart to be willing to follow him. Then came the big question from the minister as after I'd accepted Christ and had been baptized into Christ and got involved in the ministry of the church and I'm serving in a capacity. He says, Daniel, we, we, we want some of the young men in the church to speak on Sunday evenings. And we think you'd be a good candidate for that, and we're going to have a little class. We'll hold it on Wednesday evenings, and we're not going to just expect you to do it next, next week or whenever. We'll go through this little class, and when you feel comfortable, we're going to let you get up and share a Sunday evening service. You've got to be kidding me, right? I'm the guy who nailed the little plastic corner protectors on the back of the pews to keep the vacuum cleaner from nail, hang, you know, skinning it all up. I'm not the guy that's going to stand up in the pulpit and tell everybody about Jesus. If you need some little, little plastic things on, I don't mind crawling around on my hands and knees and on my belly and, and, and nailing them to the... But, but don't ask me to do that. But God's been preparing me in advance with a purpose to do just what he asked me to do. And so little did I know how God was going to lead. So I, I, I dropped the ball sometimes. You could probably even say that, couldn't you? I mean, yeah, sure. But listen to this. God has a greater circle of influence than you can even imagine right now. Whatever's going on in your life, he can use you. God, God uses every experience of our life to prepare for us to lead later. Here's what he told Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart, to, and I appointed you a prophet for the nations. Huh? Wait a minute. This man's not even been born yet, and God's already told him, here's what you're going to do. Now, Jeremiah could have chosen not to. God, but he knew Jeremiah's heart would be devoted to it. And so he chose him. God called Jeremiah before he was ever born to be a leader. Look, sometimes leading is not an easy job. There will be people who may not like all the decisions you'll make. They didn't trust always the prophets and when they told them something because it went against their will, not God's will. And sometimes that will happen. Now, think about this. Not all of us are going to have this dramatic call to leadership. I mean, some of us are just going to get this nice, simple little whisper. Hey, brother, I think you're doing a good, nice job. Hey, sister, I think you would be wonderful working with Hmm? We're not always going to get that burning bush experience. You know, we always like to say we're on fire for the Lord, but it seems like we're all, all the time trying to stay to keep getting burnt, don't we? Here's a question that George Bonner asked several community leaders. Why did you choose to lead? I just want to give you a couple of them. Most of them, the answer says, I was concerned uh, about my kids' future, and I wanted to bring integrity to the government. A coach said, why did you want to be a I asked the coach, why did you want to coach? He says, because I love kids and I love the game, and coach, coaches have a great impact. Why did you choose to teach grade school kids? And th their answer was, well, I know that there are no pliable, they, they are so pliable and teachable, I wanted to feel like I could make a positive impact in their life. It's like the little boy who told his mother that when he grew up, he decided he wanted to be a preacher. And so the mom was, you know, she's excited, but she just asked, well, why in the world do you want to be a, a, a preacher? He said, well, if I got to go to church all my life, I'd rather be the one standing up and yelling than the one sitting down and listening. <laughs> so don't sit back and wait for some miraculous sign before you agree to leave. Trust God to lead you where he's calling you as he taps you on the shoulder and whispers to you. 
Third thing we need to understand is leaders are oftentimes reluctant to leave. You ever notice that? I love those type of leaders because you know what that tells me? They're contemplating uh, themselves before God. I love people who are often reluctant. You know, as we read this passage in, in Exodus chapter 3, we see verses 10 and 11, how he even was, Moses was reluctant to respond to God. Here's what it says. He says, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But, but Moses said to God, you can always underline them buts, can't you? That shows you there's going to be a contrast to what's going on if you study language. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out? Mo Moses had tried before, but they rejected his leadership, and, and, and those scars are still there. And so as a result of that, you know, he's like, I don't need to go down that road again. I, I'm 80 years old now. I, I've been down this road. I mean, who wants me to start at this point in my life to go that way? That's just not what I'm into. Basically, what he's saying is, we're good, aren't we? Aren't you and I good, God? Do I have to go any further? I had a conversation with Steve not long ago. And as, as we talked about being an elder in the church and stuff, and he says, you know, I've, I've had a couple of good opportunities to get out of leadership in the church. And he said, uh, you know, my heart is situation and setbacks and all. He said, and even Brenda asked me, he said, well, uh, you know, do you think it's time for you to step aside? And he said, I can only serve until what time God tells me it's time for me to step down and step aside and I fulfill my purpose. No matter what you've got going on in your life, you still have to answer the call of God. You cannot simply say because I'm at this stage or because that's going on. Or because those can all be distractions Satan would use to pull you aside from fulfilling God's purpose. You need to be prepared. Don't be, always be so reluctant. You know, people say, well, I, I work weekends. I'm not knowledgeable. I'm too tired. I, 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 <laughs> folks, I had one lady in the other church said, I just don't like kids. <laughs> I've heard the, I'm too old or I'm too young or other people are more qualified than me, don't you know? I mean, it's like you kept a whole list of all of the qualifications of every individual amongst the church, and you're going to say, well, don't you go talk to so-and-so. I think they would be okay. And then somebody would say, well, I'm not gifted to do that. I'm not gifted to preach, but here I am. Other people simply decide, I love their honesty. I like my free time. Sure, I love my free time too, but that's not what God called me to always focus on. Now, I heard a friend of mine say one time, it's better to have no leadership than bad leadership. That's true. I mean, some people are just not qualified to lead, and you would know well if you've been gifted in an area or not. And the great thing about God is he's always surrounded you with people who can kind of move you in the direction or recommend the things that would need to be right for you. And so take that advice. That may be God's general nudge or whisper in that direction. A little boy came home 15 minutes late from school one day, and his mother said, I was so worried about you. Where were you? He said, Jeffrey was the school crossing guard today, and he made us wait. 15 minutes to a car came. You get it? Jeffrey was so enthralled with his power that he wanted to be able to stop a car. And he was not going to let anybody else cross the road until he said so. You know, sometimes people are not gifted to hold certain types of leadership roles. We understand that. David Faust was a little reluctant along his way. He, being president of Cincinnati Christian University, he went back and forth for months, he said, before he finally accepted the position. But that's always not a negative thing. That may be a positive thing. And finally, I want us to understand there's so many others we could go through, but I don't want to hold you but so long. A lack of faith often hinders many leaders from leading. Moses was hesitant, but Moses went beyond humility in his reasoning for why he didn't want to do what he did and God saw that it wasn't just fear or humility it was his lack of faith now Dr. Richard Hamilton puts it this way he says there's four eyes uh, uh, for his hesitancy first of all he felt inadequate you know who am I he says what who am I that I should go and God says what I'll be with you secondly he said ignorance could be blamed Here's what he would say in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. 
Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what am I supposed to tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Well, you can imagine his thoughts, so how do people will respond. So uh, Dr. Hamilton would say, you know, incredibility would be the next response to that. And he says, Moses answers in chapters four, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Moses answers, but what if they don't believe me? I mean, that's an incredible statement, isn't it? Or they won't listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And he ran from it. I would too. Only good snake is a dead snake. Very good. Well, we're learning something today in the church. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Uh Uh-uh. So Moses reached out and he took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Let me tell you something, friends. God will never lead you into a position of leadership without giving you the necessary resources to accomplish what he's asked you to do, not what you want to do. We got a cricket back there we can play. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Did you hear what I said? The Lord will never call you into a position of leadership without giving you everything you need to accomplish what he wants you to do not what you want to do. Thank you. That's where we stand as a church. Then he maybe considers himself to be a little bit inarticulate. I mean, consider, I mean, I'm that way. Here's what Moses says in Exodus chapter 4, verses 10. Verse 10, he says, Moses said, Lord, oh Lord, I have never been eloquent rather nor in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And I've told you numerous times growing up, there were times where I was told just to go over there, go away until you could get it out. Don't come over here trying to tell me that stuff if you can't say what you need to say because I had a stuttering and a stammering problem so bad. And yet I could have very well said, oh, Lord, I've never been eloquent. I've never been able to speak well. I've always been slow of tongue. I I told them. Wednesday night with the songs. I said, some of these people wrote some of these hymns. They weren't from eastern North Carolina. Some of the syllables they put together and the way that they speed it up and slow it down. Now, if they want some slow songs, we got those. But some of those words, I can't wrap my tongue around them. And God says, I bet now I want you to be a preacher. I'm like, whoa. Maybe he can even been viewed as a little insubordinate verses 13 through 14 say in, in exodus 4 but but moses said oh lord please send someone else to do it then the lord's anger burnt against moses boy do you want god to be mad at you if he's calling you to do something here it says he says his anger burnt against him he didn't say oh okay i got somebody else i'll just ask them and he says what about your brother aaron the levite I know he can speak well. <laughs> He's already on his way to meet you. And his heart will be glad when he sees you. And so Moses finally accepts the challenge. Now, let me just say this. He was dragged into it. Hmm? He was dragged into it, but he took it. And humility is not a sense of inadequacy. Humility is finding out what God has gifted you to do and then doing what he's asked you to do to the best of your ability for his sake and not your own. When it all comes down to it, God used him, and God can use you. What is God calling you to do? What is the reason that only you know why God cannot use you? And typically, it's going to be you and not him. 
You know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light shine before men so that when they see your good works, and they will glorify God who is in heaven. Wow. You know what? No matter what I do in my life, no matter how I've tried to serve in any type of leadership ability, if I solely focused on me, seems like nothing ever accomplished. But when God says, I've called you to minister and lead my church, he gets a lot of credit. He gets a lot of glory. Focus on him. Accept the truth that maybe you have been prepared in advance for a specific purpose to accomplish what God wants you to do. Sure, you're going to be a little bit reluctant, but follow through anyway and watch what God will do with you. We're going to be offering you a decision song. Uh, maybe today you say, Lord, it's been laid on my heart that I need to be stepping up in a certain area, and, and I just want you to be praying for me to do that. This is going to be a time to do that. Or, or maybe, you know, you already know that you've been serving in a leadership capacity. Maybe you're contemplating whether you should continue to lead that way. God is calling you. If he's gifted you, what, would do, what is your response? And then God is preparing the church's heart as we prepare to select even new leaders that may help take the church to the next level. What is he asking you to do in that sense as well?